Welcome to the Coming Home Well podcast, the show that educates, supports, and advocates for the veteran community. Your host, Dr. Tyler Piron, U.S. Army retired, will bring you exciting conversations with amazing guests about resources, research, and military history, all geared to helping our warriors to come home well. Here's your host, Dr. Tyler Piron. Welcome back to Coming Home Well. I'm your host, Tyler Piron. And today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to go jump back in history to an era that we often forget. We are going to talk a little bit about the Korean War, but also one of my favorite topics, all the Puerto Ricans that serve <laughs> in the military. If you've served, you know that Puerto Ricans are an essential and, and pervasive part of the military. There's a lot of reasons for that, but we're going to go into the history of that and sort of how that all started and, and why. And to get to that, we're going to talk about the Korean War. And for the folks that forget about the Korean War, which is why it's called the Forgotten War, it's all about the Cold War. After five years of simmering tensions on the Korean Peninsula, the Korean War began on June 25th, 1950, when the North Korean People's Army invaded South Korea in a coordinated general attack at several strategic points along the 38th parallel. The line dividing the communist North Korea from the non-communist Republic of Korea in the South. North Korea aimed to conquer South Korea and therefore unify Korea under the communist North Korea regime. Concerned that the Soviet Union and the communist China might have encouraged this invasion, President Harry S. Truman committed United States air, ground, and naval forces to the combined United Nations forces assisting the Republic of Korea, that's the good ones, in their defense. President Truman designated General Douglas MacArthur as the commanding general of the United Nations Command. The first several months of the war were characterized by armies advancing and retreating up and down the Korean Peninsula. The initial North Korean attack drove United Nations Command forces to a narrow perimeter around the port of Pusan in the southern tip of the peninsula. After the front stabilized at the Pusan perimeter, General MacArthur surprised the North Koreans in September of 1950 with an amphibious landing at Ikon behind North Korean lines, forcing the North Koreans to retreat behind the 38th parallel. This continued on for several more years, up and down. There's a lot of fighting. There's a lot of real, no kidding, high conflict, high intensity fighting that eventually, after several years in July of 1953, peace was broke out. At the same exact line, they had an armistice at the 38th parallel. So essentially, after all these years of fighting, everything ba went back to the way it was. Now, there's a lot of history to go with this Korean War. It went on for years, but people sort of forget about it. In between World War II and Vietnam, kind of got overshadowed by Vietnam. And so they call it the Forgotten War. There's a lot of folks, your, your probably grandfathers, granduncles. Remember, this was in the 1950s. That served in Korea, and it was horrific. It, it was a, a very cold, very, very challenging terrain, and a lot of people died. It was, a, it was a big conflict, but also a lot of heroism. And so we have a lot of things to remember. But one of the neat things, and this is what I promised earlier, is how the Puerto Ricans, not known for loving cold, were an integral and, and, and very important part of the Korean War. And it sort of changed how Puerto Rico's people served. And so to get a little bit more into that and sort of figure out some of that history, we have Jorge Mercado, who is part of a, a really neat organization. It's called Born Quineers Congressional Gold Medal Ceremony National Committee. And it goes back to a congressional gold medal that the Born Quineers were, were awarded for their service in Korea. And Jorge's going to join us and sort of tell us some of the history and, and some of the legacy. So welcome to the show, Jorge. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. What, what an excellent in introduction to the Korean War. I want to give said. great credit to the Eisenhower Presidential Library for that <laughs> synopsis, because that's where I went and got it, because I was looking around for sort of a synopsis of, of all that. And of course, they do a great job. I love our history and I love our librarians. They always do a wonderful job. So the Born Quineers 
which is always a hard thing to say because I I probably had to ask you like a hundred times how to say it, right. and I probably said it wrong because that's what I do. <laughs> what in the world is a boring quinier? Well, a boring quinier basically is the name that that's the nickname of the unit, and basically it's derived from its native island, which was called Borinquen, prior to it being called Puerto Rico. Now there's a fascinating story or understanding to how the boarding Kinier name became attached to the 65th. There's a narrative that it occurred while they were en route to Korea. But recently the boarding Kinier documentary filmmaker provided me an official documentation that the name actually existed before the Korean War. I'm still in the process of doing further research into that matter. But Borinqueños is masculine for a native or someone who's Puerto Rican. Borinqueñas is feminine. Then Borinqueños is plural. I uh, surmise, I would say that because I was in my research, I have not been able to find the Borinquenier in the Spanish newspapers. I, however, find them in the 1950 newspapers. What I find very often in the Spanish newspapers is Borinqueños. So I'm thinking maybe how sometimes individuals have a problem, have a difficult time pronouncing Spanish names. They just probably said boarding was to boarding Kenyans. But yet again, the narrative is that the name was created or given to the unit en route to Korea. So I'm looking at you as we're talking. I'm 100% sure you did not serve in Korea, but you probably have a connection. That is correct. So what is that connection? Well, my grandfather was a boarding engineer. He was one of the originals that first landed in Korea. The part, he was there part of the 1950 unit, and he actually served three years in the Korean War. Uh, he partook in eight campaigns, and that's basically my connection. It is through my grandfather's service with the 65th Infantry Regiment. And he also served with the 7th and the 27th Wolfhounds when Puerto Ricans started to be integrated through other units because the regiment was always over strength than other regiments. Therefore, they were integrated throughout other units when they were short on manpower. Do you continue this service as well? You were with the NYPD EMS at 9-11? No, 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 no. I, I basically, I was a first responder, responded that day with FDNY EMS. FDNY. I knew that. Why did I say NYPD? I didn't realize there was a, you know, I, I just assume it's all one big thing. I don't know. You know, it's New York. <laughs> they, they have like the biggest police force in the world or something. I don't know. Maybe that's what on my brain. Well, so well, you, well, you continued yes. your service. You're, you're with the EMS 9-11. And then somehow you got involved with the Congressional Gold Medal Group for the Born Quinears. How in the yes. world did that happen? Well, well, absolutely. Well, b before I go into that part of the history, let me just say that, as I mentioned, I'm a 9-11 first responder. And as we know, this day shadows trauma in the memory of many individuals to this very day. And, it's, and it is a day that changed the world. In fact, I would say that the tragic events of that day became the very catalyst for many to enlist in the military. And the two conflicts, I would even say many listening to this podcast right now, including yourself, served in. Now, I want to make a very, like I explained to you prior to uh, the podcast, that something I want to touch on that's very dear near to my heart. Unfortunately, these conflicts resulted in over 30,000 veterans committing suicide during what is called the post 9-11 wars era. And this is not to include suicide among first responders. Sad, sadly, this has become a very serious public health problem more than ever before. And I just want to say that if you're on the front lines, whether at home or abroad or even civilians, and you find yourself dealing with any mental health crisis, please know there's no shame to reach out. The help is there. And there's a community out here that loves and supports you. Now, the reason why I, I touch on the aspect of mental health, because there's a connection with my current service to the Board Engineers and my prior service as a first responder. And that is that in times of going into dark places and losing hope associated with PTSD connected to my prior service as a first responder, my dedication 
and devotion to the Board of Engineers has been my therapy, which has given me at times in very, very critical moments, the space to take a step back and psychologically fine tune the inner storm, so to speak, that many of us deal with in silence. So my labor, my, my labor of love, my passion, my task for the 65th is not only personally connected to my grandfather, but these men have become my heroes and even my saviors in so many ways. And it is for these reasons that my loyal volunteer service has stayed the course in their memory and honor. That's basically the connection of my involvement with the Board of Kenya's Congressional Gold Medal National Committee. Amazing, because we've talked to probably hundreds of people that provide all sorts of therapy, everything from, you know, raising wolves to horses to fishing to hunting to you name an activity. I think we've talked to somebody that's done it, but volunteering and, and forming that personal connection is such an amazing form of therapy. Giving back and getting involved and being a part of something bigger than yourself is Therapy. I mean, uh, they call it therapy for a reason because whatever works to help people. And so, folks, if you're thinking about like, oh, I don't really like this therapy. I don't want to go see a counselor. I don't want to learn how to ride horses. I don't want to do whatever. Do something like this. Find some of that, that, that nugget of history that you have a connection to and get involved. If you can think of it, there's an organization. And if there isn't an organization, go start one. That's always a, a great way to channel all this energy and, and passion into something productive. So, Jorge, we've talked about the fact that it's a, they received a, a congressional gold medal, but we haven't really talked about the 65th Puerto Rico and the Korean War. So let's sort of slide back to that. We, we've set the stage, we've talked about how the Korean War started and, and how it lasted for years, and like you mentioned, you were in for the duration. It was not like, I'm going to go do a, a you know, seven-month tour like the Marines do now, or a year, or 18 months, or 16 months, like sometimes the Army does. You went, you were there until victory was achieved, or everybody pulled back. Three years, three or four years in some cases, is a long time to be fighting every day. But the people of Puerto Rico signed up and said, hey, send me. How did that all happen? Absolutely. It's a fascinating account, as we all know, which how you covered in the beginning. The 3rd Division was in short of manpower. And basically, General Ridgewood wanted to reactivate the 3rd Division, which was only at 60% in total. So then they reached out. They, uh, he made the recommendation. And the 65th was activated. At the time, it there was only two battalions. They wanted to reactivate the 65th from Puerto Rico and Panama. Battalion to make a full regiment. They start calling in prior service individuals with World War II combat experience. This is where my grandfather comes in and, and volunteers and enlists. As we go into the PowerPoint, I will touch on this very topic, this very question you just asked. I got some talking points here that will thoroughly cover that more accurately in detail. We can pull it up. And what I'll sure, do, folks, sure. I, because this is a podcast primarily, but it's also going to be up on the YouTube, so you can go see it yourself. We'll have the pod, the PowerPoint up, and I'll describe it to you, and then Jorge will will tell you all about it because he knows all this stuff. I don't know anything about it, but we'll definitely make sure you can visually see it as, uh, to the, the extent of my skills of a visual descriptor. So I'll pull that up now, and, and the beginning is just a nice introduction about the Born Quineers Congressional Gold Medal Ceremony National Committee. It's a beautiful coin on the right-hand side badge on the left hand. And so that's the introduction page. So Jorge, now we have the, uh, the introduction page. Would you like me to go to the next slide? Absolutely. Just go to the next slide. Yes. All right. So we have a picture of a beach and a whole bunch of words. Right. This is basically what we went over in the beginning, where the boarding can your name came from. As you can see here, Borinque basically means land of the valiant Lord. And we just 
basically, you know, covered how the boarding Kenyans, the boarding Kenya, uh, boarding Kenyans, which is plural, which basically, you know, we touched on that there might be a, a confusion where individuals couldn't pronounce boarding Kenyans. For example, the newspapers would say Los Boring Kenyans. When you translate that into English, is the Boring Kenyans. I would surmise that maybe they say the Boring Kenyans, but again, I'm still in the investigating process of actually where the name came from. You can and go to the language is slide. a funny thing, especially when you're translating and, and you're not quite understanding exactly what it means and, and things change in translation. All right, so next slide. Next slide, yes. So here we have a picture of a whole bunch of various service members, one on a, on a ship, or actually several on a ship, one around a van, a lot of Hispanic looking men in uniform in the uh, Korean War style, some in more camouflage combat type uniforms and others in their service uniforms. They are stacked all over a ship. It's quite a, amazing. We would never be able to get away with something like that today because there'd be all sorts of safety officers going, get down from there. <laughs> So absolutely. So, you know, it's funny that basically what you're describing is actually what happened. If you look at the bottom for the, for the listening audience, there's a photo in the bottom where all their men are stacked on top of the ship. Uh, that's from the National Archives. And if you read on top, General Harris, the commander of the regiment, described that moment when the ship left docked, how all the men just wanted to get a last glimpse of their beautiful island. And there was complete silence in the ship. Obviously, a lot of these men knew they were not going to come back. Now, on the bottom right of this shot right here, you see some men. This is the Marine Lynx. This is the ship that sailed out. Uh, from there, they went to Panama. From Panama, then the regiment was split. First and first and second battalion stood on this very ship you're seeing here. The third battalion went on a different ship. The, the bottom right photos are actual photos from a daughter of a boarding engineer, boarding engineer Carmel Valle. And she was kind enough, often in our committee, we have loved ones who provide us photos of their boarding engineers and we do the ethical thing and we give them credit. And we try to break down a history connected to that time and place in the photo showing. These men on the top right, these are men, you can see them in the class A's. This is company B, this is the first battalion and these men are all going to board going to, to a peninsula that's being ravaged with, with terror. So we could go to the next fly, slide. So this one actually has a, a description of knights and the priest and, and shield. How does all that fit in? Absolutely. What you're, what you're, viewing, what you're watching with seeing here is actually the unit's a distinctive unit insignia. Which is this, that which is that of the multi cross behind the black shield. Now we have to see we have to understand the origin of because this this DUI is highly respected and loved in our current Puerto Rican community, and it originates back to the Order of Knights of the Hospital of Saint John of Jerusalem. When you go into the history, you know you have the history of the Knight Templars, you have the history of uh, the, the Knights of Malta, they, they relocated and their last location where they settled was at the island of Malta. And from there, they were the Knights of Malta. Somehow, I did research into this to see if the actual order of Malta, when it landed in Puerto Rico, but I did speak to someone from the actual order in the island and he said the order is just new, 2002 that came to the island. So I'm still doing research. If you go to the next slide, you could see how proud the boarding Kenyans wore this on their helmets. You could go ahead and describe this one. So here is a picture. It's a number of service members and their helmets and the distinctive unit insignia, a big sign. The 65th U.S. Infantry has the boarding Kenyans insignia of the Maltese Cross, a, a tiger that's up in the, or a lion up in the air. Uh, up on his back feet with the paws forward. But you can see the insignia all over the place. People are wearing it proudly on their helmets as a way to identify the unit. Absolutely. And one thing that I, that, 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 that I, I had an interesting insight into the unit's pride is that they, on one end, they're wearing a DUI, the multi-cross, that's of a European descent, right? 
but then their nickname is that of the native island. So in a way you have element or essence of two different war warriors from two different sides of the world, the Taino Indian, uh, and then the uh, Knights of Malta. You could go to the next slide. There's probably some connection to the fact that a lot of Puerto Ricans are Catholic and that's perhaps part well, of the connection. Abs absolutely. In fact, my research, uh, I, I came across that 90% of the boarding engineers during the Korean War were Catholics, 10% were Protestant. And th there, as you, we move forward into the next slides, you will see how important faith played. Now, my focal point in the 65th, though this unit served in World War I and World War II, it wasn't until the Korean War that this unit cemented their legacy by becoming a regiment aspiring for glory on the battlefield, right? And it is at, at, during the Korean War that they paved the way for many and where the recognition and respect was given to the Puerto Rican soldier. But I just briefly, briefly just wanted to share these two images that I came across. And that is that during World War II, even though they went overseas, you know, they didn't really partake in combat as much as they did in Korea. But I love this silhouette in the bottom, if you could describe it, because these are boarding engineers on the coast of North Africa training. And the image on top is Puerto Ricans doing drills in the island of Puerto Rico. In the bottom right is a landing craft. It's a small ship that what we probably use a rigid inflatable boat today. It's about that size. And there's probably about a squad or two of soldiers just jumping off into the surf, rushing towards the beach. And on the top, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. We don't use them as much. We use floating bridges, but it's a wooden floating bridge uh, with a bunch of uh, logs to support it and a, and a walkway across. And it's probably 100 meters or so. And they're walking across with their gear. And I can see a soldier with an M2 Browning, uh, the same exact machine gun we use today, over his shoulder. Uh, another soldier with a tripod. It, it's a almost a snapshot in time. It could be today, just because we still use the same type of machine gun, obviously with some modifications. And But it's the exact same gun that we've used since like 1900. But it, it's a snapshot. It's a black and white, or actually it's a sepia. But it's really clear, and you can see the expressions and, and sort of the trying to grab at the gear because it's heavy and awkward as you're trying to walk across this walkway. It's definitely an interesting snapshot in time. Next slide. So here are some prominent key players that actually wore, played the deciding factors on the 65th, 65th being activated. First one is Lieutenant General Matthew B. Ridgeway. The, then we have the governor of Puerto Rico, Luis Munoz Marin. We have uh, Major General Robert H. Sol, who was the CEO of the 65th. And then we got the commanders, the regiment's commander, which is Colonel William W. w. Harris. Now, very interesting, as you covered in the beginning, June 25th, 1950, North Korea invades. June 28th, 1950, they capture the capital of Korea, right? July 5th, 1950, Task Force Smith is created. Well, not created, they're defeated, pardon me. And because of this, the United States goes into, we gotta get combat ready. The third division has low combat effectiveness readiness. And it is July 22nd, 1950, that General Ridgeway recommends the use of Puerto Rican units, Puerto Rican, units, Puerto Rican soldiers from Puerto Rico and Panama and some other soldiers from the Caribbean as well. Within three weeks of July 22nd, the governor of Puerto Rico was alerted to activate the 65th. You could go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. Now I have a quick question. Were these folks drafted or enlisted on their own? How did that work or do you get into that later? No, well, actually we could get that into, into that later, but while you ask, let me just say that again, 1950, the regiment already existed, two battalions. They needed a third battalion. What's fascinating is that Colonel Harris went to the local Puerto Rican newspaper and requested for the local newspaper to make an announcement that there were seeking prior service members to go to Korea with the 65th. 
And within two days, the headcount was more than what they expected. That's how passionate and dedicated the Puerto Rican soldier who had prior service was committed. And my grandfather was actually, he enlisted in, he was, he was reserves. And there were some reservists that were also activated into the third battalion. So basically the first group that got there was under orders and volunteer. The picture that you see here is basically men at Fort Buchanan, Puerto Rico. Again, it's the same group, Company B. You can see the bottom, El Mundo, October 13, 1950. It's prior, you know, after the facts. And these men are combat ready. They're ready to go. You can see it in their faces. They're excited. They're excited. They're excited because they want to make a point. They want to point, they want to make a point, the worth of the Puerto Rican soldier. You could go to the next slide. So basically what we have here is the CEO of, of the third division. And what I did was, this is an actual post that I provided in the work that I do. And I just wanted to give a breakdown on how of how the regiment looked uh, as far as manpower going into Korea. Here I break down the three regiments, the head count, 957 pers uh, personnel for the uh, first battalion, 941 for the second, uh, 1,056 for the third. Now, what's fascinating is on the third side, you have units attached to the 65th. What's not often spoken about in history of the Borinquen years and the Korean War is that the service of African American service members. And the 65th throughout the war always had the 64th Heavy Ta Tank Battalion, which was an all African American troop and the 58th Armored Field Artillery Battalion. William Harris mentions them often in his book and credit must be given where it's due. Basically, this is what you see here. You see an image of the, the commander of a third division. And we can go to the next slide. So one of the things that I've, I've often learned in history, going back to like the Harlem Hellfighters and all these other organizations, they sort of kept the non-white soldiers together, even a Hispanic and African-American. Okay, we'll put them over in another group, put them together. They can be together. That's no problem. But we don't want them with the white troops or whatever, as the Asian-Americans, that we'll put them over in another group. And so you can see that here, which isn't something you often see is like, oh yeah, we have the 65th and they're primarily Puerto Rican. There's some Panamanian folks, never back in the day, kids, Panama used to be a U.S. protectorate. It used to be part of the U.S. People often forget about that. It's been a, a little bit of time in history. And then Puerto Rico. And then, hey, we're going to throw the African-Americans in there too. I'm so right. glad it's changed, but it's definitely a snapshot in time where you see this and it's a little bit different than we think of things today. So it's a good, a good reminder that things aren't always been the integrated way we've done things for many years. Basically, what, in, th in this shot right here, what I did was I provided the community a, a, a timeline. Basically, it is a chronological timeline of the 65th within the three-year span of their service in the Korean War. Now, you had asked a question about were these men drafted or were they volunteer? And here I provide the timeline of what soldier or that served at the time was he more drafted or service? He, let me just cover the talking points that I have here. From September 50 to May 51, the unit had an excellent record and was highly, highly praised throughout the American news media. In fact, you can see it right here on the top right. Boarding years highly praised with positive coverage throughout the American news media. By April 51, that was due to rotation policies the Puerto Rican National Guardsmen, while inferior to the original men who already had combat experience, still, still performed very well, still held the cohesiveness of the unit, the pride, the culture. But then things started changing. And this is where the dark side of the history comes in. First of all, let's start with the reality that by July 1951, the stalemate years of the war kicked in which was small unit fighting 
And that's where things really got ugly. And for the unit, things did not get any better because these men were young boys who were drafted, volunteers, little English, didn't speak much English, little, only on surviving only on basic training, really had no leadership. The COs that were replaced into the unit were not bilingual. Of course, this with the politics of the Korean War, I would even say there was a shortage in, in ammunition. So there are a lot of contributing contributing factors that which will now head into, unfortunately, the dark stage of the unit's history. You know, I like the fact that you don't gloss over the, the challenges that were present. I mean, the Korean War, it's cold, it's rainy, it was a stalemate. It wasn't the high conflict where people are moving and fighting and, and you don't have time to get in trouble. As we know, a, a soldier with too much time on their hand is a time bomb for getting in trouble. Anybody who's been in command knows this. It's, a, it's a, something you can rely on, just like the sun coming up in the morning. A bored soldier is a dangerous soldier to get in trouble. And it's also really dangerous. There's a lot of skirmishes. And it, it wasn't like the previous parts or even World War II where there was some bigger purpose. The media was also changing, you know, like, hey, why are we here? What are we doing in Korea? You know, it's it's not working. And so with all that, there's a confluence of things. And so it's not just all uh, and puppies, unfortunately. So let's move on to the next slide. But yeah, definitely go check out the slide deck. We'll have it well, up on the Coming Home Well. But also go look at it on the YouTube, guys. This is an amazing flow of, of Basically, the very beginning to the end of the Korean War and a pretty good synopsis. So let let we'll me just there. piggyback what you just said, something about the morale of the American soldier during the Korean War. Just imagine that, the, you know, they're, they're even, I've even read articles and even the, the, the mention of that it was basically America was just policing a civil war. But if you ask the Korean veteran, that was a war. Now, just imagine the morale of the American soldier dealing with the nonsense of the politics of the time. Now, go into the mindset of the Puerto Rican soldier, not the first batch that got there, but the other batch of Puerto Rican. And let me make something very serious. Especially in Puerto Rico, when the island was divided in political turmoil in association to its relationship with the United States in reference to statehood and independence. Yet, these men answer the call to duty, whether on volunteer or being drafted basis. And it is why it is to me and to many of us in our community that regardless if, regardless if at what stage at the war the individual served in, you just gotta give them credit especially with, with, with different mindset. The weight and, and ordeal of war was not the same for every soldier. And in fact, you know, the boarding Kenya's journey is, is one of many in a long line of individual chapters that makes a fascinating book. They all have their own stories. I've interviewed and spoken to boarding Kenya's where one is very patriotic, proud of their service 20 plus years, the other one was probably only there to serve during Korea, Korea one year and have a different viewpoint. And that is the reason why the story is different for each soldier. But at the end, credit must be given to all. The fact that they, they put boots on the ground, they served and they shouldered the pain and burden of war and try their best to, to bring back glory and pride to their beloved island, especially during a time when the social fabric of America bear the, the traits of inequality, you know, injustice. And we're talking about the 1950s. So I just want to just keep that in mind about the psychology of the Puerto Rican soldier. A book to be written about the, the politics and, and how Puerto Rico is different than the U S and, and is part of the U S and there's, uh, you know, factions that want to be completely separate or be part of the U S or continue it as it is. I know just a little bit about that, but not enough to that, even talk about it with, with any coherence. That would be a different to podcast. Know that there's a lot of different opinions. That, that would be a different podcast. <laughs> yeah, that'd be another whole series of podcasts. Yes. <laughs> but, but nonetheless. So this, 
This yes. page has a article all about a great victory with the right. 65th. Right. And who is the individual? There's an individual in a suit on the left-hand side. I don't know who it is. Absolutely. Uh, maybe it's the author, but maybe you can give us some insight. Absolutely. So this gentleman right here, the reason why I share this shot here is because this gentleman here is just is a very prominent individual, a very high profile individual once he completed his military service in New York City within the media world. But this gentleman, his name is Stanley M. Sweden. He was a war correspondent and he served in World War II. And he was, how we would say today, he was embedded with the 65th. But the reason why I share this was because this man served and covered every battle during World War II with the 5th Army and other campaigns on the front lines with North Korea, France, Austria, and Italy. And this is what he had to write about the 65th. Now, mind you, he wrote about the 65th in February when the unit was at its highest peak with morale, at its highest level of combat motivation, readiness, and he got to witness the 65th at, at its best. And this is what he writes. I have seen combat in two wars, but never a battlefield so strewn with enemy dead nor victory won at so light a cost. The, 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 uh, here, this article here that I just provided, he goes into intricate details of what he saw. And something that stood out to me, which exemplifies the motivation of the unit, go to the next slide. So I just, before we get to the next slide, I want to read the first couple of paragraphs because it shows just how good this unit was at the, at the peak of their fighting. And it says, on the Western Korean front, February 14th, the first North Korean regiment was destroyed today, trapped and destroyed by alert U.S. soldiers from colonels to cooks who turned ambush into annihilation. This was the score at the end of the day's long battle. 1,152 Reds killed, 250 captured, the remaining 300 in flight across the Han River, hotly pursued by machine gun bullets. U.S. casualties were light. I mean, what a great introduction of, of what happened with the fight. Obviously, there was all sorts of things else that happened, and it goes into details about how that all occurred. But almost an entire regiment wiped out is an amazing thing. I love the, the visual picture that he, he provides. So I, I totally understand why you have his picture. And uh, the amazing war correspondents that sit there and go to every battle and go, you know, throughout these wars who don't have to, you know, they're there to do a job, but they're not in service. They're not fighting. They're just telling the rest of the world about the fighting. It, it's kind of a, a shocking in a way, but I've talked to a lot of folks that do this and it gets in their blood. So anyway, so go to the next slide. Right. And the next slide is basically what you read. And that's what really stood out. By dawn, U.S. clerks, cooks, ambulance drivers, and even staff officers had picked up guns and were in the firing line. Now, what's, what's, what's very interesting is that throughout my research, I have found nothing but positive reviews and coverage by the whole American news media. Non-stop, heroes, brave soldiers, the word Puerto Ricans on the headlines, Puerto Ricans march to victory, Puerto Ricans this, and, but then it all changed. And it appears that this regiment has set the standards at the beginning of the war to such a high level that when the unit later deteriorated for the, due to the reasons that I've shared, drafty, lack of motivation, poor leadership, the politics of the war, a different war, instead of being offensive, now you're a stalemate, cash and grab, territory, fighting for this mountain. Looks like the media ran with it and really brought in a firestorm of crease, criticizing the boarding engineers as cowards. And a lot of Puerto Ricans in the island and here in the States took, very, took offense to it because they knew that that was not the true metrics of the regiment, despite, you know, these men, these young men, these young boys facing these challenges. We could go to the next slide. They're very quick to give praise, but then if anything goes bad, quick to give criticism as well. 
So what we have here is a very, very famous painting commissioned and given to the National Guard. It's very, very popular in our Puerto Rican community. And that is the uh, 65th doing their battalion size, uh, two battalion size in at charge. This, this, this story, this battle is often spoken very highly. Our community takes much pride in this bayonet charge. That's 65th. Basically, I provide here a picture of the bayonet charge, but then I provide the the details of who the 65th were fighting against a division and it is well known and well written and i myself if you see if you look behind me i myself have the uh, the painting towards my right and, and to describe the painting it's a bunch of folks in the old olive drab uniforms with a, a lot of cold weather gear with bayonets fixed jumping and running over the hill to charge into the Chinese. There was a regiment down there, you know, it was two platoons from echo company that were just charging into these Chinese, which is insane. You know, we always joke about the fact that we would leave our bayonets in the arms room because by God, if I need a bayonet. Everything else is already expended and, and you don't want to get in trouble for losing it. So to think about that in a modern context with the modern war, doing a bayonet charge takes incredible, incredible bravery. You go to the next slide whenever you're ready. Yep. Now, now I'm going to go into the units, of course, the most darkest moment in the unit's history. And that is Kelly Hill, which is basically what I just briefly covered it. The reason why I'm showing this slide, slide is because this gentleman that I'm showing here was actually a frontline chaplain for the Board Engineers during the era that I told you. And he was a Mormon providing faith to Catholic soldiers as he writes and describes. He, uh, he wrote a book, that's how I came across this information, Diary of a Frontline Chaplain. I actually got to speak and interview his son. This gentleman died about 15 years ago, and he just provides some very deep, insightful descriptions of the pain and suffering of the men during Kelly Hill. I mean, it's, it would be a whole different podcast. And uh, here he writes as, as he gets into the, he, he gets assigned to the 65th, right when the 65th is going into the Kelly Hill battles. And he gets to experience these men coming back, being torn to shreds and dead. And he, he reads, he writes in his diary, we keep, if we keep losing more and more men, I'm afraid the powers that be will have to take this regiment offline. We've lost so many men, it's practically impossible to maintain our position. And then he writes, the unit I'm joining the first of the week, they're practically all gone, they will, all on Kelly Hill when it was first taken. Now, Kelly Hill, just the battle which lasted for about three days, it was the point of the regiment's history that had the highest casualty battle losses. They lost 352 men just on those three battles. And for that month, they lost 413 men. And the next slide, We'll go into, we'll travel to, to, to time and place to see these actual men coming back torn or dead. You could describe what we see. people in, in one battle. I mean, we haven't really heard one those month. numbers since yeah. like, you know, World War or the Civil War and some parts of World War II usually more dispersed. And, and, you know, we obviously had a lot of conflicts with a lot of people, but it's amazing when you think about the number and the percentages I mean, that's like 50% right there. That's more than enough to take any unit offline. We haven't really seen that since, well, the Ukraine-Russia fight that's going on right now where people are, are that level of casualties. If we had that during Iraq or Afghanistan, probably would have shut the wars down a lot faster than the 20 years they raged on. Right. If one thing, so again, this is a, an article covered from El Mundo. One thing I want to highlight is that even though the regiment was pushed off the hill. It reads, the Puerto Ricans were driven back after a five hour struggle that included hand to hand fighting with the enemy. I mean, I, I, I just imagine that even these guys being outnumbered, these men, they're still giving it their all. And just imagine 
These are young boys. These are draftees. Not the first unit that landed there. But let's go to the next slide. So this image, before we change slides, is, is all the stretcher bearers, lots of wounded people with injuries uh, on stretchers and, and medics, all trying to attend to the unit. Got to picture this with all this fighting and to push them off, and they were greatly out, outmanned, and that's the reason they ran out of ammunition, and then they reverted back to bayonets because that's all they had left. Imagine the desperation and, and the, the chaos of that kind of battle. So they get pushed off the hill. The next slides, we're still gonna focus more on the dead and wounded. Now, the reason why I, I share this image here is a couple of reasons. First of all, let me, let me just read one, one of the uh, scripts on the sides. The boarding canoe you see lying here, you actually see his face here, but on the, on the actual newspaper, they crossed his eyes out because that soldier you see lying there died shortly after this photo was taken. Now, the gentleman to the right that's wearing the Maltese cross on his helmet, his name is Costanzo Antonellis. We are actually in the works of honoring his service to the 65th during his darkest moment, July 30th in Boston, Massachusetts. I actually spoke to, I'm actually in contact with his nephew and his family. And uh, he's, he actually, he was actually came, he covered throughout the news media with a lot of coverage of him with the 65th during this time. And you can see the gentleman here holding the IV bag. And this is the reason why I think this image just, just speaks so powerfully, so clear. It's an actual photo. Time, it evokes the same sort of imagery, the same sort of uniforms, the rushing of, of getting help to the wounded. The, the show MASH, if y'all remember, if you've seen it on the reruns, was about the field hospitals that were out closer to the front lines to get medical care to the injured, which dramatically saved a lot of lives because otherwise they'd have to go all the way back to the rear. But yeah, you can definitely see the Hispanics looking folks, Puerto Rican soldiers standing there uh, with a variety of emotions, both in the front foreground but also in the background, yeah, you see folks that are all tattered up and with bandages, but one guy looks like he has a smile on his face, maybe because he survived and, and hmm. you know, he's injured, but he's alive and standing up. So I guess of, of those things, that's not a, a terrible position to be in. Okay. All right, now to the next slide. Right, the same time frame on the left. If you see all the way on the left, the gentleman on the bottom, that's, the, that's Chaplain Tanellis again, covered by the uh, news media. And on the right, these are this picture is from the, the Mormon chaplain that I spoke about earlier. Those are dead boarding canyons being loaded onto the truck. Here we go again with Anton, boarding canyon Anton. This picture right here, when I just, when I got in contact with his nephew and he provided me this picture, to actually come across an actual color picture of time and place and to see just the clarity and composure and the contour and just their face, the pain, it's just, it paints a thousand words. It's, it just captures the essence of the time of, of how these men were in despair. You can see finding God amidst faith and mortality on the battlefield. That's boarding Kinnear Antonellis right now holding mass for the 65th. You and he's in the white mass uniform with the cross and, and the altar and the soldiers are in the background up on a hill, and, and there's a variety of expressions on their faces. Some are reverent, some are, you know, stand for it, and some are reading probably the hymn or something. And another soldier's just got his hand on his head, just like recovering and, and sort of just being there and taking in the moment. It's, it's a wonderful snapshot in time of combat. And same thing. This is another picture of Antis' prayer on the eve of battle. Again, maybe a different squad, different platoon, but same thing. You could actually see the boarding canyons in color here. You could see their olive skin, the black hair. You, you, it, it just gives you a clear clarity, a clear picture of what these men look like and were feeling. I mean, the, just, the picture speaks for itself. And it's around a bunker or maybe a dug-in position. So it's a No, it's a bunker, the, yes. Yes, yeah, it's, it's in the bunker and... You yeah. see him outside and you see the altar, but you also see the sandbags and the dugout areas. Definitely a, a combat photo. One of those little snapshots in time. And 
this is the last one again here goes boarding engineer antonellas and the newspaper headline reads mass before kelly hill battle in other words those boarding engineers behind the chaplain chaplain a lot of them are not coming back so that's the reason why i wanted to share this life before death so to speak and so now we're just going to go into the final section we're wrapping up some of the fascinating discoveries that i came across with some of the postings that i do on a weekly basis i covered the story of this gentleman here this gentleman i was a pow make make a long story short he got there in 1950 goes to, he goes to puerto rico on vacation and lives in puerto rico ends up in korea he's a new york he's a new yorker he's actually teaching his comrades in a boat some english uh he gets caught pow for three years i cover his story for about two years my second year into my into my labor i get the honor and privilege of actually speaking to him so what we do is we set up a ceremony and we honor him he's from the bronx so i call him a bronx boarding engineer and the gentleman next to him is another boarding engineer also from the bronx so these two men reside reside in florida unfortunately one of the other men in burgundy he passed away as often is the story with these veterans but that's the reason why I wanted to share this story. Three on or years this as a POW by the North Koreans. I can't even imagine just how terrible that would be. You're not in active combat, but you're also probably getting beaten and starved and not treated the best. And you, you never know if the next day may be your last. Right, you go to the next slide. And here is uh, my grandfather on the right. And the story behind this is basically how I, you asked in the beginning, how I came into this committee. And it basically started with a request of getting a company L roster list. And I was able to find the medic, his name is Rafael Rivera, who tended to his wounds. And the story is one of the video episodes that's up on the committee's page. And basically that's the medic that tended to his wounds during Operation Killer. And it, it's, it's, it's amazing how 60 something years later, I get to speak to the man who took care of his brother on the battlefield. So that's the reason why I shared this image. And your grandfather's on the right? Yes, on the right. So he's wearing the, the infantry aguilet. He's got the uh, classic World War or Korean War uniform with a staff sergeant stripes and the old K pot and the old uh, bandolier of, of ammunition. Uh, probably holding a rifle if you had zoomed out a little bit on the it, photo. But it, it, yes. he, I can definitely see the family resemblance here. I'm looking at you, <laughs> looking at him. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that. This gentleman here knew my grandfather as well. He told me a fascinating story. He was second platoon. My grandfather was third platoon. He was on the ship with him. Fascinating story. I'll make it real quick. Their beloved sergeant, World War II veteran, got killed by sniper fire. They caught the sniper. And his story from his mouth to my ears was that each member of the platoon put one in the dead enemy. That's his story. But this is him coming back from Korea. He was the uh, number 2000 boarding engineer to return from war. And I had the honor of speaking to him and he knew my grandfather. Oh, how wonderful. And this here, this will be wrapping it up. Here is after Kelly Hill, there was now, we, we, we forgot to cover, but we're just, there was a Jackson Heights incident where led to the a unit being court martial again, due to a misunderstanding, but the unit got integrated March, 1953, 60% continental soldiers, white soldiers, 2,100 Puerto Ricans integrated throughout other units. They wanted to reconstitute the unit because they wanted to send it back to Puerto Rico. Well, this gentleman right here is the last boarding engineer from the state of Florida to die on the last day of the Korean War, two hours before the, the war ended. He died by artillery fire. I was able to get a hold of his brother. And here on the picture on the right, you have a boarding engineer. You have Bobby Simmons, which is the brother of this so deceased soldier. And the gentleman on the, the right is my partner where we hold ceremonial events. And that is the crowd in the bottom. I just wanted to share this story. It always happens and it always sucks when you're the last guy at the die at the end of a conflict. We saw it with the 13 in Afghanistan with that suicide bomber. You heard about it. There was a whole movie made about the last person on the last day of the last second in World War II. I got hit with a sniper. It, it always sucks. But at least 
there is some recognition and remembrance of the sacrifice of each and every person Absolutely. who participated. And that's the end of the slideshow. All right. So I'm going to close the slide down. That is quite the, the jump of lots of history, a lot of heroism, and the fact that it, it's not all sunshine and puppies. Sometimes there's some dark sides, you know, when you've got new units and people get in trouble. And sometimes scapegoats happens quite often, especially with our minority partners back in the day in the 50s, all the way through Vietnam. If we can blame the other guy, it doesn't mean it means we didn't mess up as much. And so there's a little bit of racism and sexism and xenophobia and all those things that are sort of evident in some of these things. Now, sometimes things just happen. You get overrun. Doesn't mean that they're not the storied unit of, of the past, but they get beat up for it because that's an easy scapegoat. And I, I bet you there's a big part of that uh, that contributes to some of that negative press that went on. But what an amazing story. Like from the very beginning, people lining up, of course, I'm always shocked at how, when I read stories of how they used to recruit, right. you know, I, I, people are like, oh, I put an ad in the paper and we got the entire unit filled in like a day and a <laughs> half. I'm like, that doesn't happen nowadays. Like, it, mm. it, you know, it's a totally different type of, of process and standards and you couldn't do it. And I suppose if we had a, a big war and we needed lots of people, they would change those standards in a heartbeat. I'm like, all right, you're, you're standing vertical and you can walk. Okay. You're good. So what is probably the most important thing that you'd like people to know about the Born Quinniers? Well, basically, I, I think I already covered it. It is a story. It's, it's almost a love story in the sense where the service of men from the past have given many of us today a sense of pride and self-worth, knowing that, you know, our ancestors, those that came before us, you know, bear the again, bear the, the pain and sacrifice of war and open the doors and pave the way for many Puerto Ricans, as you said from the very beginning, to serve. And there's a lot more here that we there's a mountain of history here that has not been covered due to the due to the interest of time. But there is so many places that I, that I could go and take this into, so many different podcasts. But uh, in the end, I, I always have I always say this that you know, no matter what, you know, they all proudly served. They all never returned the same and many never returned, man. I, I get a little emotional. So part, but the emotions that I feel reflects the very same emotion that our community feels towards these men. We really love these men. So, uh, and for me more on a personal level in regards to mental health. So that's why it's more, you know, it's, it's very deep, very spiritual. My labor, my connection with the board engineers. So I do have one last question. Well, I guess I have a couple more questions, but is the 65th still operational or have they cased those colors? No, my understanding is if I, I don't want to say this to the listening audience, if I days say anything that's not correct, please forgive me. But I know the unit got deactivated in uh, 56, 58. And I think National Guard, I think the National Guard under the 65th still exists. Again, I may, I may be in, uh, wrong here and to the audience and to my community, forgive me if I'm not keep pro providing the proper information. It's often a, a convoluted lineage. Anytime you read about the activations or deactivations of units, it, it's all over the map. And so that's why we have the historians and the lineage folks right. in the service that keep track of these things. But it, what an amazing history. What amazing connection. I love the fact that you are so involved because your grandfather served. My, my godfather, my, who is also my great uncle, served in Korea with the first calf. And I think right. he served Thank about 18 months. And you would think that he had served his whole life as much as he would have the first calf logo on his truck and <laughs> on his hat and yeah. it was an integral part of who he was as right. a korean war veteran the things he saw and the things he did many years obviously it was probably 50 years after he got home when i knew about it you know i was just a kid and it was just an amazing thing for him to be so involved and that was one of the the main takeaways was man that the war changes you and <laughs> You can have a lot of pride in, in your service, and you should. 
because it, it's a huge sacrifice. Jorge, before I let you go, I always ask, what should I have asked you about but didn't? You covered everything. And I okay. thank you. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you. It's, it's an honor. It's a pr privilege. Thank you for your service. Thank you for what you do. Thank you what you do for the veteran community, especially with mental health. And uh, just for my community, pretty sure they appreciate what you do as well. And we thank you from the bottom of our heart. Thank you for thank your you service. Thank you so much for coming on Coming Home Well and sharing the story of the 65th and the Born Quineers and teaching me how to say it mostly properly. <laughs> my, my friends will be impressed because I always mangle words and always mangle names. Right. So uh, you, you coached me. I was like, how do you say it? Born Quineer? <laughs> I don't know. So, so Jorge helped me a little bit on that. And, and thanks again to the organization, the Born Quineers Congressional Gold Medal Ceremony National Committee. You can go find out more information. We'll put the website up on the Coming Home Well website. But if you want to go look it up while you're at a stoplight or something, it is bcgmceremony.org. bcmceremony.org. The BCM ceremony is all one word. It's super easy to find. Go check it out. They have a wonderful history. If you have served if you are a puerto rican or know somebody who's puerto rican they will absolutely love this history and the lineage and the stories and jorge thanks so much for sharing with us and coming home well you're welcome take care thanks for joining us this week on coming home well with dr tyler pieron if you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast please share it with others post about it on social media or leave a rating and a review. Follow us on Instagram at ComingHomeWell underscore BTS or on Twitter at ComingHomeWell. Thanks again. And until all are home and all are well, this is Coming Home Well.